It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Limitations 3, 22 through 23. Greetings and welcome back to the broadcast. And I just pray this morning that the Lord's mercies be upon all of us, for we are all worthy of being consumed. But his compassions fail not. His faithfulness is great. And every morning, his mercies are new. Praise the Lord. Well, today we are going to be looking at our gospel portion for today and resuming our study in the book of Acts. And we're ready for chapter 21 in the book of Acts. Uh, the gospel portion is Matthew chapter 14, verse 14 through 21. And this is where he multiplies bread. Uh, so that's just a short reading, a few verses. We'll read that along with Matthew Henry's commentary. And then we're going to get into chapter 21 of the book of Acts. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. Let's go ahead and start with our gospel portion for today. I'll be reading from the King James Bible. I'm actually going to start with verse 13 instead of 14. Here's what it says. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, the disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fish. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake, and gave the loaves to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat, and were filled. And they took up the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. And they had that had eaten were about five thousand men besides women and children. So what we have here is one of the famous stories where Jesus multiplies the bread and the fish and feeds the multitude. There was 5,000 men. That's not even counting all the women and children. They only had the five loaves of bread and two fish. But when it was all over, everyone was satisfied and they picked up 12 baskets of fragments. Here's what Matthew Henry's commentary says. He says, when Christ and his word withdrawal, it is best for us to follow seeking the means of grace for our souls before any worldly advantages. The presence of Christ and his gospel makes a desert not only tolerable, but desirable. This little supply of bread was increased by Christ creating power till the whole multitude were satisfied. In seeking the welfare of men's souls, we should have compassion on their bodies likewise. Let us also remember always to crave a blessing on our meals and to learn to avoid all waste, as, frug as frugality is the proper source of liberal uh, lib liberality. <laughs> Seen in this miracle, an emblem of the bread of life which came down from heaven to sustain our perishing souls, the provisions of Christ's gospel appear mean and scanty to the world, yet they satisfy all that feed on him in their hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And that is the gospel portion for this morning. We're going to move on to our study in the book of Acts. Um, like I said, we're ready for chapter 21. If you remember, we left off Paul telling some friends, I have to go to Jerusalem, but the Holy Spirit's telling me that chains await me there. He says, and he tells them, I'm never going to see your face again. And they're weeping and all of that. And in this story here, Paul makes his way uh, to Jerusalem. And so that's what we're going to be taking a look at. We're going to read chapter 21 uh, out of the King James Bible. And so let's begin. Verse 1. And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them, 
and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Coos, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence Patara. And finding a ship sailing over into Phoenicia, we went abroad and set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload her burden. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that we should not go up to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down and on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship, and they returned home again. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemyus and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we'd entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was coming to us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. And then Paul answered, What mean ye weep, and to break mine heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. All right, so we have Paul being warned multiple times by by the Holy Spirit, by prophets, that he go to Jerusalem, chains await you. And this prophet comes down from Judea and takes Paul's belt or girdle and ties him up with it and says, this is what's going to happen. And all the people are begging Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. But Paul says, you know, and you look at Paul's heart. He says, I'm not, not only am I willing to be bound up in Jerusalem, I'm willing to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14, And when he would not be persuaded, we cease saying, The will of the Lord be done. And after those days we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea, and brought with them one Manson of Cyprus, an old disciple, with whom we should lodge. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly that the things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it, therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. All right, so here's the issue. The, these disciples in Jerusalem are saying, look, there's been... The things you're doing with the Gentiles is awesome, but there's some, but there's a lot of Jews who have come to faith, but they're also zealous for the law, and they're hearing about you teaching the Gentiles that they don't need to observe the law, and so when they show up, they're going to want to basically see that you still practice these things as a Jew. And so that's basically what we have going on here. And so, 
it appears that Paul is going to take like the Nazareth vow, the Nazarene vow. And remember that Paul said, I become all things to all people. To those who are under the law, I become under the law. To those who are under, uh, who are not under the law, I become not under the law, right? He says, I become all things to all people that I might win some for Christ, okay? Um, but he does tell the Gentiles that you do not observe these customs. Why? Because they're not Jewish, Quite simply, they were not for them. And you and the Hebrew roots people will say, no, that's not true. We're all supposed to. Well, here's, well, let's read the next few verses. So this is, so this is what they say to him. Verse 23, do therefore this that we say unto thee, we have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify them, purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they are were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. So they're saying, hey, take this vow with these other guys who are doing the vow. Then all these Jewish believers who are zealous for the law will see that you are still Jewish and still observe these things. And But you, again, people say, well, that's, see, that's not just for the Jews, that's also for the Gentiles. Verse 25 as touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from the thing offered to idols, from blood, and from strangled, and from fornication. So they're saying, but as far as the Gentiles, we have already written them. And remember, we read that in what, Acts chapter 15, where the Gentiles were... Uh, upset because they were being told by the Jews that they have to shave, that they have to um, get circumcised and observe, observe the law, but they wrote a letter to them saying, no, you don't have to do those things, but you need to stay away from these things, because why? Because they're offensive to the Jewish people, for starters, uh, eating things that are off of the idols, eating things that are strangled, don't any, eat anything that has the blood in it, and abstain from fornication which means sexual immorality. So let me read verse 25 again. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple and signified the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. Okay, so Paul goes ahead and he does this thing. Now, he's going to be in the temple. And just like what's happened to him in every city that he's been in, it seems, the Jews are going to see him. These are not believers in Christ, right? These are not the Jewish believers, but those who are still uh, in Judaism and rejecting Christ as Messiah. They're going to do what they've done in every single synagogue that he's been in. This time it's going to be in the temple. They're going to create a riot and stir up trouble. Uh, for Paul, verse 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law. And this place and further brought Greeks also into the temple and have polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him in the city of Trophimius, an Ephesian whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band, that all Jerusalem was in an uproar who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down into them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left the beating of Paul. So not only are they laying hands on him, but they're actually beating him as well. And when the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done, and some cried one thing and some another among the multitude. And when he could not know the certainty for the Talmud, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. 
and when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. So the people are in it, just going nuts. They're in an outrage here. Verse 36, For the multitude of the people followed after crying, Away with him! And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art thou an Egyptian which before these days made an uproar and ledest out of the wilderness four thousand men that were murderers? Okay, so did you, did you catch that? I mean, people are spouting off all kinds of accusations about Paul that are not true. And even the centurion is like, whoa, you can speak Greek? I thought you were this Egyptian who led a bunch of people into the wilderness and they were all murderers, which is not true, right? Verse 39, but Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, and that's where verse, and that's where chapter 21 ends. Kind of silly that the chapter ends halfway through a sentence, <laughs> but it does. Uh, not in the originals, obviously, but we will pick up and find out what Paul said next week. However, I do want to address th at least this. You'll notice it says that he beckoned the people and then spake in the Hebrew tongue. And so we have a lot of people in the world who try to say that the Hebrew language was a dead language at this point in time, and it's clearly not. As we will see several times in the book of Acts, Paul, or at least more than times than the one we're getting ready to read, he will speak in Hebrew, people will hear it in their native tongue, and then they'll start paying attention to what he has to say, because, whoa, he's speaking Hebrew, you know, the Greeks don't speak Hebrew, the Gentiles don't speak Hebrew, so Hebrew absolutely was not a dead language. Um, it was clearly used. Now, there may be some times in history where it's used more ceremonially. Um, it's it, it's dead. it became dead in the sense that it was not used like it is today. Uh, the language has revived, which is the first time in really human history that we know of where a language like that has gone dead, dormant, and now is completely living again millions of people speaking it um, but it absolutely was not dead at this time as we clearly see Paul's getting ready to address this crowd in Hebrew well I pray you were blessed this morning by this podcast and hey you may not agree with my interpretation or my view of, of the scriptures um, but I pray that we have the common ground which is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that he died for our sins and that God rose him up on the third day and anybody who believes in this will be saved and that we can have that common ground and that we can be believers who are known for our love towards one another um, be people that pray for one another I ask that you pray for me I need I need God's mercy just as much as anyone if not more and uh I need God's favor on my life and hand on my life, just like all of you. And I pray that uh, this podcast is being a blessing to all of you. The website is www.scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to find the archives. And to support this podcast is 100% listener supported. So if you're being blessed by this and you're able to support it, uh, you can do that by going to www.scriptureandprophecy.com. That's it for this morning. Lord willing, I'll be back with you on Friday to continue our study in the book of Jubilees. Peace and grace be with all of you. And until next time, God bless.